Hey guys, welcome back. So we're finally going to get into that video about how do you code a Garch model in Python. So the only really new library I would say you'd need is this one called Arch Model. So although it's called Arch Model, it's going to allow us to model any type of Garch process. So if you don't have that, you can go ahead and just do pip install Arch Model, and you should be able to get that. Now, just as a quick theoretical reminder, before we go into the code, this is what a Garch 2.2 model, which is the simulated process we'll be creating in just a moment, looks like. The reason it's a Garch 2.2 is because first off, we're modeling the time series, which here is a sub t, based on two lags prior, so a sub t minus 1 and a sub t minus 2. That's why there's a 2 in this position for Garch 2.2. And the second 2 in the order of the process comes from the fact that the time series is also a function explicitly of its volatility from last period here, sigma sub t minus 1, and two periods ago right here, which is sigma sub t minus 2. So the whole story, the Garch process, remember, is telling is that the time series is a function of not only its own lagged values from whatever periods in the past, but also its volatility or standard deviation or just colloquially how jumpy it is from some periods in the past as well. Now, if you've seen my theoretical video on Garch, uh, you'll notice that the names of the parameters are slightly different. For example, I'm using omega as the constant, alphas here, and betas here. But that's only because the output of this software package, Arch model, is going to give those as the names of the parameters. So I want to keep my equation consistent so it's easier for us to understand. All right, so let's go ahead and first simulate some Garch data. I didn't want to use a real data set here because I wanted to see if we could get exactly those parameters back when we simulate and then try to recover those parameters using the arch model package. So I'll just quickly walk through how do I create the data. So I say I want a thousand periods of data. We can consider these as days or weeks, months, whatever. Here's me inputting all of my parameters. So I've chosen omega, the constant here, as 0.5. Alpha 1 will be 0.1, alpha 2 will be 0.2, beta 1, 0.3, and beta 2.4. So we're going to see how close to these we can get when we fit a Garch 2.2 model to this data. So I go ahead and just create it literally based on the equation above. So although this may look complicated, you see that the form is literally omega plus alpha 1 times the series 1 period ago squared, and you can read the equation, and it's literally taken from this mathematical formulation right here. All right, so when I do that, this is what my simulated Garch 2.2 data looks like. Before even doing any more formal testing, you can already tell that this may be a good candidate for the Garch model because there's periods in here of high volatility, such as from 400 to roughly 600. There's a very high volatility here versus periods of much lower volatility. For example, here maybe 550 is an area of lower volatility. Now let's actually plot that volatility to see where it's the highest and where it's the lowest. Usually you cannot explicitly do this, but because we have simulated a process, we had the volatility at every time period. Specifically, the volatility is given by this part that's the square root, excluding this epsilon sub t. So this is given, this is the volatility. Again, that's coming straight from the theoretical Garch video that I have a video for. So we see the volatility looks like this, and it's really best if we plot the volatility and the series on the same plot, which is what I do here. And you can see that the red volatility is highest exactly when the blue series is jumping around the most. So we see that matches up really well. Now, if we were just given this data and we didn't know what was the generating process, how would we know that we should start with a Garch 2.2 model? Well, there's a lot of ways, but here's kind of a heuristic that we already know about, which is the PACF plot. Recall that PACF stands for Partial Autocorrelation Function. And let's think about what happens if I were to look at the square of the data I've generated. So that is the square of A sub t. Without really getting to the math here, that's going to square the left-hand side and the right-hand side which means that the square of my series will be some function of the one lagged square of my series and the one lagged and the uh, two lagged square of my series. So I should see a spike in the PACF at one and a spike in the PACF at two, and it should sort of shut off after that. Let's see if that's what I see. Indeed, that is sort of what I see. We see the spike at one, pretty high, spike at two, pretty high, and then it sort of shuts off. Of course, the spike at three and four are above the windows here, so you can make an argument for considering them. But an argument for not considering them is that after 2, it shuts off rather rapidly here. So you could potentially start with a Garch 4 or something, but 
we'll just start with a GARCH2 uh, process here. So that's our reasoning for starting with a GARCH2.2 process. Now we're going to split up our data into a training and testing set. So notice we generated a thousand periods of data. We're going to be keeping a hundred of them at the end for testing, and we're going to be using 900 for training. So that's just what I do here. Now, fitting the model is, as always, pretty simple, but that's not really the part that's going to make you a good data scientist or economist. It's going to be really knowing what is the underlying math behind this model. So to actually fit the model, we create a model object from the Arch model library, putting in the training data and putting in the lags, so p equals 2 and q equals 2. So this is a GARCH 2-2 process. I'll just note here that, of course, this is also good for making an arch process. You simply just make q equal to zero, and now you have some kind of arch process. Now we go ahead and fit it by just doing model.fit, and we store that in a model fit variable. We see lots of things getting printed out. This is just some stuff about convergence. So now we can look at what the estimated parameters are by doing modelfit.summary. And there's a lot of good information here, but let's go right down to the bottom where it tells us what the estimated coefficients are. Keep in mind that omega was supposed to be 0.5, so it's estimated as 0.67, a little bit off, but not very, very off. And it is significant, which means that we should keep it, so that's correct. And on that note, it says that we should keep each one of our uh, coefficients, which is correct, because they were literally used to generate the process in the first place. So it's good news that we see that fact again when we fit the model. Going back to the actual values of the coefficients, alpha 1 was 0.1 estimated as 0.15, not too off. Alpha 2 was 0.2, estimated just pretty much around that value. Beta 1 was 0.3, pretty close here with the 0.27. And beta 2 was supposed to be 0.4, again we get pretty close here. So we see that it's not getting exactly the parameters used to generate the process, but I would consider this a success in terms of how close they are, and more importantly the fact that they're all predicted to be uh, relevant in our final model. Of course, all that's left now is to try and predict the volatility. So the whole point of GARCH and ARCH is to predict the volatility of your time series in future time periods. The reason being that if you think the time series is going to be really volatile next week, that might affect your decisions, for example, for buying the stock or whatever uh, nature of your data you're looking at. So to predict stuff, again, it's pretty straightforward. You take your model fit, which was the result of fitting the model here, and you go ahead and do forecast, horizon is equal to some number. This is basically how many periods in advance you would like to predict the volatility for. And you can look at this code for how to actually plot it. You see that this orange line is the predicted volatility of the data on our 100 days of testing, and the blue line here is the actual volatility. We see it's surprisingly very good. Of course, there is a period at which it stops being good, but that's pretty far in. For example, even up until maybe 50, so maybe about half of the testing set, it's doing a pretty good job of generally capturing the volatility increasing from 0 to 50. Now just as an experiment, let's see what happens if we predict way, way in advance. As we know, with most time series predictions, if you start predicting way in advance, the model prediction is just going to degenerate into something not very useful. And it's no different here. If we predict a thousand periods in advance, we see that for the first 50 it was pretty strong, then it becomes weak, and then it kind of just levels off to some constant value. So that's pretty expected. And as the last thing we do in this video, let's look at the rolling forecast origin. As a refresher, we've looked at this in a couple videos, but uh, this was the prediction of volatility of all 100 future periods at once. But usually, if you're using some kind of prediction in practice, you're going to predict just one or two periods in advance. And then once those one or two periods data become available, then you'll include those in your prediction and then predict the next one or two periods. So I won't go through the code of rolling forecast origin, but we see that if we predict only one period in advance instead of 100 periods in advance all at, this, all at once, we get a very, very, very strong prediction of volatility. So we see here blue is the true volatility and orange is the predicted volatility if we're only ever predicting one period in advance. So we see that this GARCH model does a very, very good job on this data, and that should be somewhat expected because the GARCH 2.2 model what was, is what was used to generate the data in the first place. All right, so hopefully this helps you to get an idea of A, how to generate GARCH data, B, how to figure out what order of GARCH model you might want to use, and C, how to finally fit the model and make some relevant predictions on your data. 
So in our next video, we'll be looking at Garch actually on some real data. We'll be looking at some stock forecasting. All right, so the code will be available in the description below. And until next time.